Morning, everybody. Welcome to the first session of the last day, uh, Tech Ed 2012. Um, hopefully, uh, I'm not speaking too loud for most of you. <laughs> Headaches not there or anything like that. <laughs> Okay, so welcome. Uh, my name is uh, Rajiv Badressa, as you can see hopefully on the PowerPoint. Um, I work for Old House Computer Training, um, specializing as a, a senior systems trainer in uh, teaching Microsoft courses. Um, I do wear a number of different hats um, at Old House, um, and as I said, uh, one of those hats actually involves me uh, running um, systems training courses uh, on behalf of Old House. So, um, hopefully the reason for your choice of attending this session is either you thought the title was really, really long, okay. Or yes, you thought you might be able to catch up on a bit of sleep after last night. Depends on the, yeah, what you're hoping for. But really what I hope to do over the next hour or so is spend a little, time, a little bit of time talking about some of the new enhancements they've got with regards to failover clustering and Hyper-V uh, with regards to Windows Server 2012. So in terms of the areas that I'll be looking to cover, um, as I said, um, the failover clustering enhancements, uh, we'll look, look at some of the enhancements with regards to the clustered shared volumes, um, look at um, how um, there's the ability to set up a failover cluster which is actually based around SMB version 3, uh, which you may use for actually storing your Hyper-V virtual machines, okay, or even potentially for SQL. Um, also look at um, how um, CSVs have been enhanced, um, so that's the cluster shared volumes, okay. um, and uh, potentially look at also the feature which is called no drain that we have within failover clustering. So just so I can position it, just uh, out of interest, how many of you have already deployed failover clustering within your organizations? Okay, so good. Okay, so hopefully I'm talking to the right audience as well. And how many of you are actually using failover clustering specifically for Hyper-V? Okay, so most of you have been using, using for that. Um, any of you using um, failover clustering for other workloads, SQL or Exchange? Okay, so good, got the right audience, so that's perfect. Um, so hopefully I'm already preaching to the converted. Um, so from there on, the second session, or the second part of the session, I'll really cover off the Hyper-V Hyper features um, that uh, can now take advantage of uh, failover clustering. So specifically look at uh, the VM priority options, um, the clustered live migration. Some of you hopefully are planning to attend um, Ben Armstrong's session where he's going to talk a little bit more about some of the live migration features that have been changed um, in Server 2012, uh, where there's no requirement for actually having a cluster. And that's one of the pretty significant enhancement. Okay. Um, then talk also very briefly about storage migration and VM monitoring. So um, if you weren't already aware, um, failover clustering is, uh, is, is the way or the mechanism by which um, high availability can be provided for either Hyper-V or your SQL workloads, okay, or Exchange workloads. Um, and that really provides the infrastructure for the private cloud. Okay. Um, over and above that, um, Hyper-V providing the ability to host um, the workloads. That, obviously, that's the virtual machines. Okay. Um, and then System Center, which of course is the layer which sits on top to actually perform the management of those um, layers below. So just again, a little bit of positioning around um, Server 2012 and the private cloud infrastructure. Um, I guess really the, the enhancements they've made with Windows Server 2012 give you greater flexibility. So um, from a storage or networking perspective, um, there are certainly some enhancements around um, how you can do it. I think one of the most significant parts of that is you can continue to do what you may already be doing for your existing cluster. So you might be using fiber channel storage or you might be using iSCSI. Is you know, one of the significant enhancements is around SMB3. Okay? And the fact you can actually use that for hosting your storage. Okay? And hopefully you'll get a, a good idea of that by the end of the session today. Um, also, the flexibility. Um, again, just out of interest, how many of you, when you deployed your failover clusters, how many of you actually went with Server Core? Okay, very few of you. So presumably you had to go with full-blown GUI because you really didn't have the flexibility um, to maybe manage the infrastructure if you're using Server Core. Now, I don't know whether some of you caught some of the sessions. I think Farin was running a session yesterday around you know, the, the flexibility you now have with running Server Core and moving between Server Core and the full-blown GUI. So really, it's a bit, a bit more realistic um, now to actually use Server Core and have that flexibility of managing it. Okay. Um, I know certainly for us um, at Old House, we actually deployed clusters in each, each of our locations, and I decided, yep, yeah, I'll go with Server Core. Um, and then, of course, I had some of the challenges along the way with managing it. Okay. I ended up using things like Core Configurator. Any of you seen Core Configurator? This little GUI that you can slap on top of Server Core on R2. Okay. And that gave me a little bit of extra, flex extra flexibility. So, you know, I guess the, the ultimate aim of using Windows Server 2012 as your foundation for your private cloud is really to give you that flexibility. So, you know, whether it's internal customers or if some of you are actually hosting on behalf of uh, your customers, giving you that flexibility so you can actually provide you, you know, some great degree of value, if you like, um, to those customers. 
So I guess as a starting point, I've got a number of demos lined up. Um, what I'd like to do is just very briefly show you um, something that's probably not too hard if you've already been using Silver 2008 R2 um, and you've seen some of the other demos that have been going on. But if I can just launch into a very brief demo of adding um, the roles and, uh, and features, um, this is, is not necessarily rocket science um, as such, but if I can just jump onto one of my um, remote nodes that I've got on here. And again, you've hopefully all seen some of the enhancements around Server Manager and the flexibility if you are managing a Server Core machine. Okay. Um, you do have the ability to add the roles of features directly from that. So just to complete um, a demo that I'm going to use throughout the, 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 the session today, um, I've got um, basically two clusters that I've already set up. Um, it was unrealistic for me to do an end-to-end build a cluster in an hour. So I've already built a cluster so I can show you some of the enhanced features of it. But um, if I can just very briefly show you um, the process of adding the, the roles of features. And as I said, this is not necessarily rocket science. Um, you may have seen the enhanced features around Server Manager. So if I'm doing this remotely against a Server Core machine, which of course you can now do, you can either use Remote PowerShell as you may have seen if you went to, the, to James Finley's, one of my colleagues' uh, sessions yesterday. Okay. Um, so you can either use PowerShell or you can, of course, use Remote Server Manager against there. Okay. And there's a number of different tools. But um, to complete this process, I'm going to just um, connect into my Node 4 and effectively show you how you would add things like the file server role. So I'm gonna, for part of the demo later on, I'm going to be using the file server um, feature or file, file server role, apologies. Okay. Um, some of you, again, if you're using the workloads around Hyper-V, you could add the Hyper-V um, role okay. uh, to avoid me, have, avoid me having to reboot. I'm going to just go with the, um, the file server one. And also the failover clustering. And as you've seen, hopefully again previously in R2, it knows the dependencies and can add the relevant features as required. So with regards to this, a relatively straightforward demo, I'm sure you'll hopefully all agree. Okay. I can complete the process of installing the roles and features required to set this up. Okay. So I'll just leave that going in the background and go into some of the more advanced um, concepts uh, and demos. Again, uh, if you set up clusters in um, Server 2008 R2, you would have hopefully gone through the process of actually doing a cluster validation. This is to ensure that the um, hardware that you're going to be using actually meets the prerequisites, and Microsoft will be able to fully support that cluster um, once you've actually installed it. Um, so some slight enhancements with regards to how that cluster validation works. Okay. Um, checking out to make sure that you've meet um, the requirements for running cluster shared um, volumes. Okay. Um, looking specifically at logical uh, units or the LUNs, and also support for identifying whether you might be using hardware that's going to use uh, replicated storage for example, so you've got a multi-site cluster. Okay. So there's some uh, enhancements with regards to that. And again, pretty much as you may have seen in R2, you can run that cluster validation wizard at any point for your cluster. Okay. So if you need to go through a revalidation process, um, you can do so. Some number changes. Um, I don't know whether anyone remembers um, how many nodes we could previously have in a failover cluster in Server 2008 R2, um, but really we were restricted. So you know, now, whereas before we could only have 16 nodes, now we can have 64 nodes within our failover cluster. Okay, so significant enhancements around that, okay, which gives you the greatest scalability. I suspect, and I should have double checked this with Nathan, um, I suspect that there was even between RTM and, uh, sorry, between release candidate and RTM, I think enhancements with regards to the number of VMs that you can even support within the cluster as well. I think they doubled it to 8,000, that's right, yeah. I think Nathan changed his slides right at the last minute on, um, on Tuesday or Wednesday, rather. Okay. So, you know, some big, big changes with regards to the, um, the scale of it. And uh, as I said, CSV has really been enhanced. If, if you recall, um, when you were setting up or adding cluster shared volumes, and for those of you that don't recall the details of it, um, cluster shared volumes were added in R2, and it really gave us the functionality so that we can actually um, host multiple VMs on a single LUN. Okay. If you go back through the history, when, we, when um, R1 of Hyper-V was released, okay, you really had a one-to-one -one relationship between the LUNs and the virtual machines. With clustered shared volumes, it gave you the flexibility then, have, then to have multiple VMs on a single LUN. Okay. But it was exclusively used for Hyper-V. When you enabled cluster shared volumes in your failover cluster, you had to tick a box that said, this is only going to be used for Hyper-V. Okay. And again, if you haven't used this before, it had basically added a, a junction point, if you like. So you had this C colon backslash cluster storage and a junction point to all the volumes that were CSVs. Okay. Now, CSVs have been enhanced and can be used for other features. Specifically, the main one that you're going to see is really with the, the high, highly available file server. Okay. And this then gives you the flexibility of actually having a highly available file server, which can then be hosting your virtual machines, your VHDs. 
know. Um, also potentially using that in conjunction with a SQL cluster. So you can have your SQL databases on that SMB3 highly available failover cluster. And that's really where it starts to get to quite interesting. So yes, the, the main and significant enhancement is, um, is the fact that it can actually be used as the scale out uh, application platform for a file server. Um, and as I said, uh, file-based via SMB storage for Hyper-V, so you don't actually have to connect to storage that's actually going to be using um, you know, iSCSI or, or Fiber Channel. Also some improvements with regards to the backup okay, and removing some of the you know, challenges or issues, if you like, um, around um, using and supporting CSVs. Now, um, as I go through this slide deck, which of course will be also be made available for you to use uh, or to download um, after the, um, the session, um, notice that there are some references to some of the other slide decks now. Um, this was originally presented at TechEd um, North America. So these are references to the North America slides that you'll also be able to download as well. So just notice in the bottom, bottom right hand corner, if you want more detailed information, there's a level 400 um, set of slides around CSVs in Server 2012. So um, what I thought I'd do is just run, run through a very quick demo of adding CSVs to Windows Server 2012. So if I can just flick out of that and flick back over to my demo. Um, I would like to also complete this other process. I'll do a couple of uh, things here as far as my demo is concerned. Um, I'm going to flick over to my um, second cluster. And uh, what I'll do is I've basically got um, only one node within my cluster here. So if I've got uh, now the ability to just uh, um, add another node, so I'll add um, that one I've just installed a feature for. And uh, in this instance, I'll say I don't need to run the validation test because that'll just simplify the process a little bit. So once the um, node has been successfully added, uh, what I can then show you is um, as far as the roles themselves are concerned, okay, um, I'm going to configure a role. And this, again, just ref references what I've been talking about uh, with regards to SMB3. You can create or add the file server role. And the significant difference I want you to notice there is if you've ever, ever added or created a file server role in um, the R2 version of failover clustering, you really only had the top option, a file server for general use, in which case only one node owns that particular file server role, and it fails over as and when. Okay, so if that node is unavailable or you want to transfer it, you can do so. Whereas now we've got two options. With the scale out file server, that's really where we actually have simultaneous access to that file server through multiple nodes. And this is really what gives us that high availability for SMB3. Okay. And I've got a couple of slides just coming up around that. But I wanted to show you that process. I won't be doing an end-to-end -end exercise around that, but that's something that you may want to investigate. Okay. Um, so you do make your choice um, as to whether you want it to scale out file server. Okay. Um, and of course, you then complete the process around that. Okay. Um, my focus was pre predominantly going to be the Hyper-V parts, but that's something you certainly want to be um, looking into. Okay, so that's set the one thing I wanted to show you. Um, the other thing that I wanted to go through the process of was adding some more storage. So this gives me a good excuse to talk about the fact that um, the iSCSI target is now built in directly to Server 2012. Okay. So some of you might be using iSCSI as far as your storage. You might be using Fiber Channel as part of your storage. Now, of course, you do have this option of actually using SMB3 for your storage for your virtual machines. Okay. Um, but to complete this exercise or to show you the process, uh, I'm going to go through a very brief um, demonstration of adding some more storage to my cluster. Um, and like I said, it gives me a good excuse to show you also the, um, the iSCSI target as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a new um, iSCSI virtual disk. So I'll go through the process here. Okay. And I'll add a new uh, LUN, which I'll also use later on for some of my BitLocker um, demonstrations. So I'll just say I'm creating a new LUN. I think I got as far as five when I was doing all my practice ones. So I'm going to call this one LUN6. So I'll create a new VHD. Um, I'll write, make it relatively small so that my BitLocker um, demo will be pretty straightforward as well. So 500 meg. Oh, let's make it slightly bigger so we know it's a different one. So it goes 750 meg. And I'll create a new iSCSI target. Okay. Sorry, I was going to go back there. Yeah, it was LUN6 that I was using. Yeah. So I create a new iSCSI target, LUN6. That. There. 
and I'll add the initiator. So again, if any of you have done any work with, um, with iSCSI, um, hopefully you're familiar with the idea of the target being the location where the storage is and the initiator being the clients to that particular bit of storage. Um, one, again, enhancements they've made with regards to the iSCSI is rather than having to manually type in or know the initiators, um, you can actually just connect to those Server 2012 uh, machines and it'll learn the initiator name anyway. Okay, so I've already got it in cache here because I've already done that process, uh, but it makes it a little bit easier when you're actually adding the, um, the um, initiators that connect into that um, target. So if I just add my two initiators, nodes one and two, and again, whether I want to have um, authentication with regards to that storage access. So I'll just complete that process, and I've got some new LUNs that should be accessible from my two nodes. So that's my um, iSCSI storage added. If I then go to each of the individual nodes and run up from the tools menu the iSCSI initiator, I'll just be able to refresh and hopefully see some new storage that's available. And I'll just go through the process of connecting that up. So I'll just uh, connect that storage there. Oh, the window doesn't quite fit there. So if I can close it from there. And then I would likewise, I'll repeat that on my second node. So I've got uh, two nodes, uh, as I said, in the cluster. And if I just go in and run the iSCSI initiator so they can then connect into that uh, storage. And just connect in. And I forgot, I should also go through the process of going to volumes and devices and just auto configure those. Okay, so I've done that. I've got to go back to the other node and complete that other process. So bear with me. So again, volumes and devices, auto configure, so it's got the storage. And then last part of this process um, is to go through and go into um, disk management and actually just initialize the disk. So hopefully what I'll see if I go to the node there, open up computer management, and then go to disk management, there should be that new, hundred, new 750 gig, or so 750 meg rather, um, disk, which I should be able to add and initialize. So if I just bring the disk online, initialize, and create a simple volume on it. Uh, six. Okay, so now I've at least got some storage that I can successfully potentially add to the cluster. I'll use the failover cluster manager over there to take the nodes. And if you hopefully notice the disks that I've got available, um, I've gone as far as five disks, um, some of which I'm actually using for, for Hyper-V um, later on. Okay. And it's just a case of actually adding disk. And it should recognize, right, okay, I've got a new disk, which is 750 meg. Okay. And I'll add that to my storage. So really, that's nothing to do specifically around, with C around CSVs, but it does show you the process of actually adding a disk to a cluster. And some of you may have done that. That's not really that significantly different to what R2 did. Okay. Um, but adding the CSV part of the equation, um, again, for those of you who are unfamiliar, um, what I want you to be aware of is when you add something to a CSV, it makes it accessible from multiple nodes. So if I go to the C drive of node one, I can see this cluster storage folder. And underneath that, I see you know, some links to the actual cluster shared volumes that I've added. Okay. And both nodes have the ability to simultaneously access that. So you'll notice I've got as far as volume four. Uh, these are my ones I was doing as, the, as practice ones, yeah, which are about 500 meg in size. So what I'd like to do now is just take those existing disks, right click and add it to cluster shared volume. Because at the moment, it's not really being used as a CSV. It's just a standard disk that's being added. Okay. As I complete that process, what you hopefully will see is it's added a new volume to the CSVs. Yeah. So like I said, it's a bit underwhelming, really. If I'd have just shown you how you can just right click the disk and say, add to cluster shared volumes, wouldn't be much of a demo. But hopefully by showing you the process of adding the storage and then adding it as a CSV, you see the end result of it as well. Now, um, something that I'll talk about a little bit later on as well is the idea of storage pools. So I don't know whether some of you caught um, a session that I think was going on yesterday. I think Rick Klaus was doing a session yesterday around storage pools. Okay. Again, some interesting enhancements they've got with regards to storage pools, which makes it um, potentially um, a lot more flexible in terms of how you can provide storage to your cluster. So I'll talk a little bit more about that in the, in later on in the session. 
Okay, so there's adding CSVs. Let's get back to the deck. So really, this is the, um, the idea I've been trying to get across. And I think this is, it's an interesting um, proposition, um, whereby if you want to provide high availability for your Hyper-V, uh, you now have the flexibility of saying, well, what I'm going to do is actually have a Hyper-V cluster, which is going to be running all your workloads. And then at the back end of that is actually going to be a highly available file server. So this is the scale out file server. And the VHDs themselves are then stored okay, on an SMB3 share. So you, use, you provide a UNC path to run those virtual machines from. And then, of course, the back end for that file server cluster could be using you know, your standard storage that you might be working with, so your fiber channel or your iSCSI, okay, or potentially even these storage spaces I've been talking about. Okay. Um, and then you know, you're running CSVs on top of that. Okay. So you have that flexibility uh, if you want to provide high availability. And uh, you know, your, your virtual machines that are actually running on that to SMB3, you'll still have transparent failover. So you know, if you have a situation where you know, one of these file servers within the file server cluster fails, it has no impact on the access from the virtual machines or the hypervisors, you know, the Hyper-V hosts. So potentially, you could do what's on the left-hand side here, where you have a cluster that's going to be supporting your file server elements. Okay. And then you could have a Hyper-V cluster, or if any of you are using SQL, SQL is also supported, SQL Server 2012, supported as a workload that can sit on top of SMB3. Okay. Or if you want to, you can take advantage and move over to the right-hand side where you have a single cluster. The downside, I guess, with this layered approach here is you've then got two clusters to manage. Here you could potentially have a single cluster. Okay, and remember, of course, you can have up to 64 nodes in that cluster. Okay, um, and then still effectively have SMB3 um, that's being used to access it okay, um, across there. And then maybe three or four of the nodes, as per that uh, um, slide indicating, okay, could actually be running Hyper-V. And two of the nodes could be running SMB3. Yeah, good question. So just to, to repeat the question, so what's the, what's the benefit of actually using the extra layer of having SMB3 on top of it? I guess really from a, um, a high availability perspective, it gives you the ability to support um, the Hyper-V hosts don't necessarily need to have anything other than networking to connect in. And that's really, I guess, where the value proposition is. You know, providing high availability at the moment now for your, your um, failover clusters, you probably have to consider single points of failure, failure around your fiber channel HBAs or something like that. Here, potentially, you can just nick team, and of course, some of you may have spotted the fact that you can now nick team natively within Windows Server 2012. So networking is really the only functionality you need to actually then get access to your storage. Yeah. And I guess that's really where the opportunity may lie yeah, um, with regards to using SMB3 as the back end for your storage. Yeah. Any other questions while we're pausing for thoughts, comments, questions? No? OK. Um, I was wondering, I was scratching my head a little bit when I, when I saw this uh, particular slide to present around. I thought, check this. Well, that's not particularly interesting from a technology perspective. Okay. Um, but it is actually quite a significant enhancement, okay. um, particularly if you get a situation where your disks need to go through the process of being checked. Okay. It can have a major impact with regards to the um, performance, because you may be waiting hours as it goes through the process of doing a check disk against um, one of your, uh, your disks. Okay. So now, again, some of the enhancements they've made around this um, is the disks can be scanned um, online, okay, and the disk, or the volume rather, only needs to be brought um, offline in order to repair it. Okay. Um, so again, you know, you've got to less downtime, if you like, if you're using those cluster shared volumes. Um, I reckon, I think some of the Microsoft guys were saying they've struggled to find um, a disk that's large enough to have check disk run beyond two or three seconds. Yeah. So a good indicator of, you know, like I said, if, any, if ever you've rebooted a server and then found it's got to run through its check disk process, you don't get get chance to cancel it in time, and you're waiting hours for it to actually go through its check disk process. Um, another enhancement they've made, another enhancement rather they've made with regards to cluster shared volumes, is if you have a situation where you've got a branch office where you've decided to deploy a failover cluster, you can go through the process of actually enc encrypting using BitLocker um, the drive itself. Okay. So it's fully supported now. So, like I said, if you have a situation where you've got lower security, branch office, I guess, would be a good example. You can go through the process saying, well, what I'd like to do is actually now encrypt the entire contents of that particular drive. Um, so, of course, it's secure. Yeah. And I've got a demonstration where I can show you that.
So let me um, walk and talk through the process. Um, in preparation for this, um, it is all command line. Um, I've got a few um, PowerShell um, commands that you're going to have to run to actually get um, BDE to work. So I'll just uh, take that existing CSV that I just added, and I'll go through the process of actually encrypting it. Okay. So um, let me walk you through that. Um, so first of all, I'm going to use the ISE to get all this, and again, to avoid you having to see my typing or mistyping of this, I've prepared everything within the ISE um, to actually just check out whether those things are there. So hopefully you can um, catch up or see a bit of this um, at the back there as well. Um, what I'm going to do is actually just um, run um, that particular commandlet okay, to manage the BDE status. Okay. Um, what that should hopefully show me as I scroll down there, you'll hopefully see um, all the different drives and telling us whether those drives are actually encrypted or not. And if you notice this one, okay, uh, volume five, which is that LUN6 that I just added, currently in a, in a state of being fully decrypted. So of course, it's not protected as, as such. Okay. So what I'm going to do is, as I go through this process, I'd like to, um, to go through and encrypt that particular volume. Now, just before I do that, I'll just check one of the prerequisites there as far as the disks are concerned. Um, notice that my disk um, that I added earlier on as far as the CSV owner is concerned, okay, um, it's actually owned by Node 2. This has some impact as far as my demo is concerned. So I'm just going to quickly flip that over so I don't have to keep moving around um, between my different hosts. I'm actually going to just move that um, so it's now owned by Node 1, which is where I'm running the demo from. So let me do that first. And if I then just run the next command that I want to do this. So this is going to be running uh, against volume 5. So I'll say, right, manage BDE. Okay. Um, and just check out the status for that one. So run that particular script. And again, just repeating the fact that it's actually fully decrypted. So I'm going to enable the BitLocker drive encryption on volume 5. Okay. Now, in order to do so, I'm going to get it to fail first. Okay. Um, the disk has to be in maintenance mode. So if I can just show you the reason it won't do it first, and as I said here in my little notes to remind me, it must be performed on the coordinator node. So my coordinator node was node 1. Okay. Previously, it was node 2, so I kind of flipped it over. Okay. So if I show you the failure first so you can see um, the issue, oh, let me just put that to volume five. Okay. Select that and run the command. So I expect it to fail. It's basically going to say, no, you can't do this okay, because it's part of a cluster. This gives me the opportunity to also show you that I can take a disk, which is currently within the cluster. Okay. And if I hit more actions, I can say I want to put it into maintenance mode, okay. which, as you can imagine, and as the blurb says there, okay, once I put it into maintenance mode, it's not going to be available to the cluster or to the CSV. So if I put it into maintenance mode and then just rerun the commandlet, what you'll hopefully see is it goes through the process of encrypting that particular drive. Now, note here, um, there will be a recovery password that you would want to note if you are enabling BitLocker drive encryption, because that recovery password, of course, you'd have to use in case there's a failure and you need to recover any of the data that's on there. Okay, so you'd make a, a note of that, uh, that particular number there. Um, but if I just rerun some of those other commandlets that I was running before to just check whether it's actually encrypted successfully, uh, and again, I'll just change that against volume five. And what I'd hopefully notice or expect you all to see there is it's fully encrypted. Of course, I've chosen a relatively small drive um, to make it easy for the demo to show you that it's actually can complete the process. So now we've got an um, encrypted drive. One of the extra things that you'll also have to do, and the slide reflected this, but I must um, just go back and point this out. Um, I'll just go back to the slide, and I didn't uh, stress it necessarily. Okay. It is really important when you actually enable the um, encrypted cluster volumes okay, um, that you make sure that the cluster object has permissions against um, the encrypted volume. So what you have to do is add the security descriptor for that. Otherwise, the cluster will not be able to decrypt yeah, the contents of that. Okay. So that uh, second bullet point is actually very valid and why I'm going to go back here and show you all. Uh, I'm going to run another command, look, get cluster. So I'll just execute that. And hopefully what you'll see there is it just shows you my cluster name, so just RBCL1. Okay. And what I need to do there is, as again, as, as I put in here as my little comment, you know, important to add the SID for the cluster as a protector. Okay. So what I'm going to do is just run that as a protector for volume five. Oh, do that one. Execute that. And it should have added my computer account okay, um, to have permissions against that, in which case now, I've got a fully encrypted uh, volume 
uh, CSV, which I can bring out of maintenance mode. And both nodes should be able to have access to that. So that's pretty much BitLocker on top of a cluster shared volume. Again, happy to pause for questions if anyone's got any comments or questions at this point. Yeah, okay, so again, the question there, if anyone did, didn't catch that, okay, does the CSV still have a master server? Well, effectively, it's still called the coordinator node, okay. And of course, that's what I was changing previously. Um, so yes, absolutely. So as I was showing you um, when I had to actually set, set the demo up, okay, um, because I wanted to actually do the encryption, I had to, to run that against the coordinator node. So as we see the disk, it'll tell you which is the owner node. Yeah, so that concept is still there. Um, you can easily just transfer that, as you saw me doing, okay, um, when you do a uh, move, yeah, and just choose a, a node that you want to move that to. Okay. Um, storage spaces, which I think, as I said, Rick um, did some presentations. I don't know whether some of you attended that uh, late yesterday afternoon. He was talking a little bit more about storage spaces. And really, again, this is a, an interesting concept, um, giving you the flexibility to take uh, what is essentially commodity level storage okay, and put together, uh, without having specific RAID controller cards or anything like that, put together some kind of level of protection against it. So what I want you to, to notice with this is you have the ability um, to set up a failover cluster. Okay, um, and on that failover cluster, all you have is some kind of sh shared SaaS storage. Okay. So um, that SaaS storage, which, and it specifically has to be SaaS if you're gonna be doing this, um, as I found out when I was trying to put together a little demo for this. Okay. Um, Non-RAID, and then what you do is you create your storage space on top of that, okay, uh, which can then protect it. So you can then put a uh, mirrored um, storage space um, effectively ac across that, and then you can use that to run a CSV. Now, what does this mean in practical terms? Um, you potentially could set up a failover cluster with some pretty commodity level storage. You don't need to have even iSCSI. Okay. Shared SAS bus with some, you know, some disks, some JBODs, yeah, which you can then effectively put together into some kind of a mirrored volume, which means your costs to get into a, a failover cluster are effectively minimized. Uh, you don't even have to use iSCSI for that. Yeah, so the question there is, you know, can you use iSCSI to actually connect into different um, storage arrays and mirror those? Um, that really depends on, I guess, your third-party products, I guess, if you're using third-party iSCSI. Um, something I haven't done a lot of work with, because, uh, again, being the, the product being relatively new, um, I have seen that when you actually set up your iSCSI, you can actually set up a highly available iSCSI as well, so you may be able to get around it to doing that way. Yeah. But I haven't done enough to, to work with it to say definitively you can do it with everything out of the box from Microsoft. Yeah. So um, what you may notice as part of this process is um, as well as having disks here, this is where we also have pools. Now, unfortunately, I couldn't put together a demo on this because it relies on some physical SaaS storage, so I couldn't actually get that part going. Okay. But what you would see here is to, you add to your cluster a storage pool. So you'll see there's a, you know, the ability to create new storage pools in here. Um, but unfortunately, you can't do these. If the storage is actually being you know, is through, through iSCSI, which is how I've done my cluster, okay. no go. So I tried to work around that and uh, so I could put together a little demo, but I could, just couldn't do it. Okay. But that's the, uh, the process that you would do um, where you basically add your, your JBODs okay, through that process and you can add it to your cluster. Um, some enhancements with regards to clustering uh, for Active Directory. Um, some things like when you create a failover cluster, the computer object is now created in the OU where the cluster nodes exist. Okay, as opposed to putting in the default computer's container. You can change this. Okay. Um, uh, also, if you have a situation where you've got some dependencies because your domain controllers are actually VMs, okay, um, the cluster can start without those domain controllers being available. Otherwise, you've got a situation where you've got a bit of a circular dependency. The cluster can't start because it can't see Active Directory, and Active Directory hasn't started yet because the cluster hasn't started because it's a virtualized D set of DCs. Okay. So now it can actually boot without um, having access to the Active Directory. Okay. Um, and also, if any of you are using things like read-only domain controllers, you can set up a cluster which is using RODCs. Yeah. Quorum. 
a feature again, if you're hopefully already familiar with, with regards to failover clusters, how much do we still have to have running in order to actually maintain this cluster? How, do we, how can we maintain quorum? So um, again, some enhancements they've made with regards to cluster quorum is you can specify which nodes will actually have a vote in terms of actually maintaining quorum. By default, our nodes have a, um, a vote of one. And if you have a situation maybe where, as the slide suggests, you've got a primary site and a DRS site, okay, you can effectively say those nodes don't have any, any votes around the, the quorum. Okay, um, and therefore, effectively, we can still maintain quorum, okay, provided our nodes within the primary site continue to run. Okay. Another thing that you can also do is actually have a dynamic quorum. Uh, this could be quite useful if you decide to set up a three-node cluster. Okay. And the thing with a three-node cluster, if you were to set one up, okay, is if one node fails, then you've got two nodes left. Kind of obvious. Okay. So of course, you've still got a majority of all your nodes available. But at that point, okay, it doesn't change the quorum settings. So therefore, if another node fails, well, now you've only got one out of the three original nodes. So therefore, of course, the, no the cluster can't continue to run. Instead of that, and that's how it would work in under R2, now you have the ability to have a dynamic quorum, where basically it will react based on the number of nodes that are currently active. So maybe you want your cluster to still continue to operate okay, when you've only got one out of the three nodes okay, in your cluster. So what you have the ability to do is say, well, what I'd like to do is actually enable this dynamic quorum feature, which, funnily enough, is the default setting now for failover clustering. And I'll, I'll very briefly demo how you can see some of these settings I've talked about with the, the node votes um, and the dynamic quorum. But it does give you greater flexibility if you have multi-node failure within your cluster, because it just adjusts what's required to maintain quorum at that point. So if I just, uh, I'll just flick over to my, um, just before I get into this next section, I'll just flick back over to my cluster here. And if I um, right click the cluster and more actions, configure cluster quorum settings. Uh, what I'd like you to see here is if I go to advanced quorum configuration and witness selection. So um, you can specify which nodes are able to vote. So this is where I was talking about before, where you can actually say, right, which nodes have some impact in terms of the voting process. And also, as I said, it's a default setting now. Allow the cluster to dynamically manage the um, assignment of node votes, which effectively, as I say, will allow you to have flexibility. If you have a multi-node failure, you can basically handle it. So sequential node failure. Sorry, I had a question there. Yes, so again, you'll still go with um, you know, the, the recommendation with regards to the, the cluster setting or the quorum setting, I should say. Um, but if you wish to, you can still say, right, I'd like to use a disk witness as well. So if you've got a, I can't remember how it works. So I think if you've got an even number of nodes within the cluster, it adds the disk as an extra um, part of the quorum. Yeah, that's still there. Yeah. Yeah, that's not, that's, that's not something I'm sure about, actually, to be honest with you. So the question there, just to repeat, um, is if you have a failure of one of the nodes. So let's say, I guess, if you start with a four-node cluster and then you drop to three, um, whether it dynamically takes into account the fact you've got a disk witness. I'd have to check that out. Not, not Yeah, well, I, I, th I guess the fact that it's actually got dynamic quorum in there, I guess a removal of the node would probably do it. But I haven't tried it. It's a really good question, actually. <laughs> yeah, OK, no worries. OK, and of course, uh, again, your, your usual scenario about being able to choose which disk you're actually going to be used as part of that, um, that quorum disk. Any other thoughts, comments, questions while we're they're coming hard and fast? No, OK, so um, cluster ched schedule tasks. Um, the flexibility now, which actually is used as a building block for something else I'm going to talk about um, shortly. Um, the flexibility to actually run schedule tasks either against everything in inside the cluster or a specific node, something that can be configured, as you can see, with some PowerShell commandlets. Okay. Um, giving you flexibility, particularly if you're going to be doing the what's called the cluster aware updating. This actually forms the foundation for CAU, um, which you know, if you're doing patch management against your cluster, um, giving you the flexibility of saying, right, OK, run this task against this particular cluster or this particular node. Okay. And like I said, I'll clarify, or you'll see a little bit more about that when we look at um, cluster aware updating. Okay. Busy slide, lots of detail in there. Okay. Um, the key thing I want you to take out of this particular slide is the ability to say that you want to drain the nodes. Okay. Now, particularly useful for things like Hyper-V, 
um, and something that was only previously really available if you're using the VMM functionality. Maybe what you want to do is actually say, I'd like to um, do some maintenance on one of the nodes. So you want to drain all the roles that are currently on that one node and move them to another. Okay. With a single click, you can go through that process. It will then, if you're using Hyper-V, okay, live migrate the virtual machines away so you can then perform your maintenance against that particular node. Okay. So, um, and then once you've done, you can basically say, I'd like to, to bring that back. Um, it can also be used um, against SQL Server or file server ones as well. Okay. Um, but uh, probably the easiest way to see the impact of this or see what the node drain does is to, for me to demo it. Okay. So if I can move over a bit more to the Hyper-V type stuff that um, you can see here. What um, I'd like you to all uh, notice is I've got um, two nodes in my cluster, as you've hopefully picked up on. Okay. Um, one node is doing bugger all at the minute, so I've basically got that in a safe state. It's not, um, not performing anything just yet. It'll, I'll bring those back online for a, a later demo. Okay. But um, maybe node two, I want to do some kind of maintenance against. Um, and you can see hopefully there that it's running full VMs. Um, you'll see the significance of this priority, which is new also in um, Windows Server 2012. Um, you'll see the impact of that um, in a later demo. But all I would like to do is just right click the node. I'm going to do some kind of maintenance against it. So I'd like to pause access to that and drain the roles. As I do that, notice it then says, right, I'm going to live migrate those VMs to the other node within the cluster. Okay. The other thing you may notice is it will do it based on the priority and it's doing simultaneous live migrations. So something, again, I'm sure Ben Armstrong will pick up on a little bit later on, okay, is the fact you can now do more than one live migration at the same time. Okay. This happens to be doing two. You can customize that based on your network uh, capabilities. Okay. So once I've drained the node, okay, I can, of course, then shut it down, evict it from the cluster if need be, perform whatever maintenance I need against the, um, the node. Okay. And then once I bring it back up again, I can resume fail rolls back, in which case what you'll hopefully notice there is it will fail everything back. And again, another feature you'll notice there, and this was a real pain that uh, potentially in Server 2008 R2, is it will actually queue up the migrations. So if you're doing lots of VMs that you have to migrate over, you don't have to select, wait until that completes, select another one. Okay. You can just queue them all up. And again, I'll pick that up. I'll show you that in the slides as a, as a separate demo as well. Okay. But what it'll now do is bring all those VMs back into play. Okay on to host two where I've completed my maintenance tasks, whatever they may be. So that's, I think, a, quite a significant enhancement there. While I'm waiting for that to have completed, I'm just going to start up those VMs on here so that's ready for another demo that I'll do. And just to point out um, the other part of the equation, and like I said, Ben, I think, will probably pick up on this later on. Okay. Um, the idea of multiple live migrations, if I can get into my Hyper-V manager when it decides to respond. Because I'm powering up those two, two VMs, so it might just take a little bit of time before it's going to play ball. And if I just go into the Hyper-V settings for that. What I'd like you to notice, and like I said, I think Ben will be picking up on a lot of these things. You, know, you can specify how many live migrations you want to happen simultaneously. So by default, it's two. You can go with more. So that's no drain. No drain really can be used as the basis for um, this other feature, cluster aware updating. So you get to your you know, patch Tuesday, okay, um, and you need to go through the process of actually patching your cluster. Um, you have this coordinator um, element okay, for cluster aware updating. It can perform the patches against one host. Before it does so, it drains the node, apply the patches, reboot, okay, move the VMs back, okay, apply the patches, etc., etc. So this really gives you the flexibility for managing all of your updates that you might be applying against the cluster. Okay. Now, in order for this to work, you've got to have this, um, uh, this element, which is called a cluster aware um, updating or update coordinator. Okay. Um, and it will work in conjunction with your existing patch management solution, whether that might be WSUS or whether you might be using Config Manager or something like that. Okay. Um, but you can see a, a bit of detail there around the, the, the workflow for that process. Um, the update coordinator itself can actually be is cluster aware, so you can actually stick that in your cluster. Okay, so that can move between the nodes if need be. Um, now, I haven't got a specific demo on this one. I wasn't actually going to run through a lot of patches on Server 2012 because there probably aren't a hell of a lot. But if I can just show you in the interface, um, when you want to enable the cluster aware updating, um, 
actually it's a feature you've got to first um, enable. So you can actually add that as a role and um, I'll go to the roles. Uh, and I'm going to the wrong place. I think it's actually a property of the cluster. And there we go. So there's a link there for cluster aware updating. And what you have to do is actually enable um, um, an, an update coordinator, which is actually responsible for managing all that. Uh, which as a set in itself can actually be uh, enabled on, um, on a cluster so it can move between the different nodes if need be. Okay. So you first create um, your or enable the cluster aware updating, okay. um, and then you specify a node that's going to be responsible for that, or a, a coordinator that's going to actually run that. Sorry, the question there was, uh, will that be SQL patch aware? Um, no, I think this is specifically around um, uh, the nodes within the cluster. So I guess if the nodes themselves are running SQL, okay, I guess that would be the case that it would actually be recognizing that. It's really just more about how do we patch it, move the stuff off, or move the, the VMs off, or the, the, the SQL instance, or whatever it might be so off. Yeah, I'm not sure, to be honest with you. I, I, I'm not much of a SQL person, to be honest with you. Um, but that would be something we'd probably have to investigate. Yeah. Okay, so specifically, some of the things I've already touched around. Um, so we're kind of halfway through the session and to covered off the, the clustering parts of things, the failover clustering. What I'd like to do is just pick up on some of the things that are specifically around Hyper-V. Um, and one of the things that I've already um, prepared for you to, to see, and you may have seen when I was actually doing the, 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 um, the draining of the node, is how we can prioritize certain virtual machines. Okay. So um, this becomes, comes into play in, in two instances, where we start up the VMs, these ones start, will, will start first. Or if there's a situation where we lose some of the nodes within the cluster, those ones which are low priority. So if you've got a mixed or a, a cluster which has got a mixture of production and test and dev VMs, and your test and dev VMs are low, and they could be compromised if need be, if you lose some of the, um, the, the functionality within your cluster, okay, um, it can start to kick in. So again, hopefully to, to appreciate this, I've got a little demo that might um, show you the process. What I'd like you to notice here is that I've got um, node one is currently running two VMs which have got a low priority. Now you can set um, the priority manually on the, the VMs by just right clicking and then setting the priority. Okay. So if I um, just get that to run, so we can say change startup priority. Okay. So of course you can change them anything from high to low. Okay. And I've got two VMs that are currently there running in low. And if you look and notice on node two, um, I've got two VMs which are high and two VMs which are medium. And what I'm going to do as part of this exercise is just test out, and this is where I have to do my prayer to the demo gods. Okay? I'm going to test out the high availability is going to kick in. Okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run a PowerShell commandlet here okay, where I force a restart of node two. Now just remember node two is running four VMs, two of which are high priority, two of which are medium priority. So once I do this, there's only going to be one node left in the cluster, but it's running some low priority VMs. Okay. So if I can just line this up hopefully so that we can see what's going on. Okay. I want to just show you guys if I go to node one, which is going to be the surviving node, if I can just have that running. Uh, it's running slow because I've basically got to, those VMs consume quite a lot of resources. Okay. And if I just run this command here. Oh. So basically, I'm just going to run a, a PowerShell command which says restart the computer, do a force. Okay. And let's just see what the impact has on those VMs there. So provided that runs. And this is where the fun begins. So first thing to hopefully notice, um, the failover cluster should recognize the fact that node 2 has failed. That's a good start. Okay. And then I get uh, the failover cluster manager not responding. Okay. Not quite part of my plan, but let's just see what happens next. What I'm hoping you'll see is it recognizes the fact, oh, hang on a second, there's these VMs that were running on node two, which are no longer there. Let's fail them over. But there's not enough resources on node one. So what it now does is it says, OK, well, I'll tell you what, let me save the state of one of the VMs okay, um, that's low priority. So it saves the state of that. Okay. 
so that in order to actually then run those VMs that are higher priority, they come back online. Yeah, which is again quite quite a useful thing. You can prioritize which VMs have priority in case there's failures. Okay. And it's going to sit here trying uh, to, to still bring those um, these low priority VMs up and running, okay. but it should hopefully by the end of this uh, scenario have most of the VMs that were high or medium okay, up and running. It just seems to be waiting on getting that one there to go, but I think that's pretty much successful in terms of what I wanted to demonstrate. Yeah. I'll leave that going in the background. <laughs> It's the joys of doing these live demos, isn't it? Okay. So what was that? Okay. It all worked perfectly fine. And that fact, in fact, that's exactly what I hoped to see. You know, like I said, this just this high one that seems to have an issue. Um, maybe it hadn't correctly saved state. But just remember, you know, really what we're doing there is we're testing out the high availability. This is not live migration. This is all right. There's been an entire failure of a host. Okay. Let's um, power on the VMs that were running previously on that host. Okay. Now, what will happen is Node 2 will eventually come back. So I've, you know, I haven't got ILO to necessarily monitor it. Okay. But Node 2 will eventually come back, and then what I can do is I can migrate some of the VMs back over to it. So that's VM priority. Um, so again, the question there that uh, Peter's asking is, you know, when that node failed and the VM that was running on that isn't able to run any longer, will it automatically come over? Well, at this point, what I'll have to do is manually free up some resources. So in my scenario, what I'll have to do is actually say what I'd like to do is migrate some of those VMs that were the high and the medium back to the surviving node or the node that I, I killed. Okay? And that will then free up enough resources for it to be able to power on. Okay? Yeah, so again, the, the second part of that question is would, would VM Affinity assist as part of that process? Um, I guess if you've configured the VM Affinity, then that would actually then kick in and say, I'd like to run that over here. Um, and of course, if you've got um, System Center Virtual Machine Manager, which might actually be using things like dynamic optimization, okay, in which case it'll realize, oh, okay, there's another, another host over here, and this host is working far too hard, I'll move some of the VMs over. So yeah, you may have other processes that will kick in okay, once the survivor or the node that failed comes back in. So again, um, some things that I've already touched upon. Um, the live migration queuing, if you actually say, I'd like to take a list of uh, VMs and migrate them over. Okay. Um, if, they can't, if it can't do all of them at the same time, it'll just queue some of them up. Okay. And as you hopefully have seen, two concurrent live migrations, which you can change. Okay. Um, and then some of the other things that we've, I've already touched upon, like node drain, um, cluster aware updating, that's also available within Hyper-V. Okay. Interesting thing also that's been added, to, um, like I said, um, that Ben Armstrong will pick up on, is VM storage mobility. Um, the fact you have flexibility to move running and live virtual machines from one storage location to another. So you can move them from your you know, SMB3 file shares to local storage or you know, from your iSCSI okay, or your fiber channel if need be. Okay. Um, that works within your clusters and again, zero down downtime with regards to that. So as I said, I think Ben's doing that session. I think it's the one after this one or maybe the next one in the, in the afternoon. Okay. So you do have a lot of greater flexibility now, whereas before live migration would only work if you had a failover cluster. Now you can take a standalone Hyper-V host, live migrate it into a cluster. Okay? And that could either be live migration with regards to the CPU and, ma um, and RAM, okay? or it could be from the storage perspective. And likewise, you can live migrate or storage migrate um, your virtual machines between clusters, okay? or yeah, out of the cluster to a standalone host. That gives you a lot of flexibility now. So, Hopefully, and uh, this will be where the uh, interesting st things happen. Okay. Hopefully, my second node is now back in the cluster. Okay. So it looks like it is, and really this comes back to, to Peter's question he was asking about there now. So of course the fail back hasn't taken place here because I didn't have any affinity assigned to those virtual machines. I didn't tie those to it. But what I can hopefully do now is just demonstrate something that you've already seen the results of hopefully anyway. If I take my high and medium priority VMs, okay, so if I just take um, too high and too medium. Okay, I don't know why it still thinks that that one's starting. Okay. And if I just right click that and say move, okay, what you'll notice within the interface, um, now within the failover clustering, is of course I can sp specifically say am I going to do live migration or quick migration, which has been around since R1. Okay. Um, if I don't want to choose the node itself, it can choose the best possible node, so that's a new feature. And also this is of course where we can initiate the virtual machine storage migration, which as I said, you know, Ben will pick up on later on. So if I just say live migration, best possible node, what I hope you will see there is two things. It will migrate more than one VM at a time, and also any VMs that are not, it's not able to migrate um, get added to the queue. 
stuff. Of course, it can do multiple VMs and then queue up the rest that are waiting. Uh, my VM one is clearly bitter and twisted about something. I'm not quite sure why. Um, but if I connect into the console, maybe it had, actually had a failure of the machine. Sorry, say that again. The priority is picked up two mediums before it picked up online. Yeah, I, to be honest with you, I don't know on that. Uh, so the question there is, why did it pick up on the medium priority ones as opposed to the high priority ones when I actually did the live migration? I don't know what criteria it uses when you initiate the live migration. Um, that priority seems to kick in certainly when it prioritizes the start of the VMs, but it doesn't always seem to kick in when you actually do the migration of the VMs. Yeah. So to be honest with you, I've got to do a bit of work myself and we'll find out exactly why that is, but I did notice the same thing myself. Yeah. It may well do that, yeah. So initially, I. Th yeah. So it has successfully moved back um, the other VMs, um, which were okay, the medium and high priority ones. Okay. Um, this one, as I said, has obviously clearly got some kind of issue. And uh, what I would expect to have seen now is once the resources were freed up uh, related to. to um, and I didn't actually start that one up. Okay. Um, what it should then is actually go through the process of actually starting that one up. And it, it is attempting to do so, but it looks like it still thinks there's insufficient resources. So oh, again, I'll leave that in the background. I suspect this is uh, causing it to fail a little bit for whatever reason. Okay, so some of you hopefully attended um, James's session yesterday. Uh, my colleague here was doing some uh, a bit of an overview of PowerShell. Okay. Hopefully that's the only reason. Uh, hopefully that's not the only reason why you're here. You know, there's a laptop draw at the end of this. I've got to tell you some questions. Okay. Hopefully that wasn't the reason why you decided to come attend. Okay. Um, I'll very shortly tell you um, uh, what the second part of that question is, so you guys can get to your answers away for that. Um, but as you hopefully would have seen from you know, the hour presentation that James did yesterday, um, some significant enhancements with regards, with regards to PowerShell. Um, with um, Hyper-V now, um, you've got commandlets that are built into it. Again, if you weren't aware, um, you didn't really have any PowerShell commandlets for Hyper-V unless you used um, a, a module from CodePlex to do that with R2, okay. uh, or unless you're using VMM. Now this is built directly into it. You've got all of your commandlets around there. Um, you've also got the commandlets that you can use around clustering. Okay. So if I can just very quickly demo this. Um, and if any of you didn't attend James's session, you might find this of interest if you're going to be looking to win this competition if I can put it that way. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to um, fire, fire up um, into my um, integrated scripting environment. Okay. And uh, if I can just uh, fire up, actually, well, I'll fire up a new instance because that'll probably be the safest way. Um, so let's just do a new tab. And if I can just, oh, no, I don't even need to do a new tab. Let me just start up a new instance of PowerShell. That's probably the safest way. So if I can just run PowerShell. And hopefully you can just about make that out the back. I might just need to change the font size a little bit to make it easier. OK, it's the highest one. OK, so all I'm going to do here is see which modules. So if I do a get dash module, okay, what I'd like you to notice is there are no specific modules that are currently loaded for either Hyper-V or failover clustering. Okay. So if I run a commandlet, or if I show you some of the commandlets that are available for VM management, okay, so if I just do a help star uh, VM star, this will show me a whole list of commandlets that are available. Okay. And I'm not going to go into all the detail of them. You know, there's a lot of flexibility that's there. Okay. Um, but if I can just run one of the commandlets, a nice simple one, get dash VM. And of course, that'll show me all the VMs okay, and what the current state is. Okay, and most of them seem like they're running and operating normally, except that VM3 that uh, obviously is bitter and twisted about something that I haven't quite worked out. Okay. Um, and then if I also do a get dash cluster storage, or sorry, cluster group, I should say. Yeah, that'll show me all the cluster groups. So there is an association between the cluster groups and the VMs, okay, um, and which nodes they're running okay, on. And if I do a get dash module against having done that, you may notice okay, I didn't specifically have to import the modules around Hyper-V management. I didn't have to specifically import the modules around cluster management. It's just there and works out of the box. Okay. So the commandlets just, just work. Okay. Um, and like I said, I could go into the specific detail. Um, there are loads of commandlets, so you, know, you can work out what you may need to do um, around that. 
And of course, you can take the results from one commandlet and pipe that through. So you can take your cluster commandlets, okay, pipe those into Hyper-V, and vice versa, you can take your Hyper-V commandlets and pipe those into clustering. And again, a lot of detail around the specifics, um, whatever you may need, need to be doing. Okay. Um, whether it's moving virtual machines or updating the virtual machine configuration, um, they're all supported in there. Also, um, the flexibility to move um, VM storage profile, or VM storage rather, or adding a, a VHD um, to a virtual machine. Okay. If it realizes the fact it's clustered, it will verify that the path is correct and then take the action and then automatically update the configuration. This is something you had to manually do. I don't know whether some of you remember doing this in, the, in 2008 R2. If you made a change within the Hyper-V console, okay, at the end of the Hyper-V console change that you made for the settings of the virtual machine, you had to update the virtual machine configuration within the failover cluster. Okay. This happens automatically. Automatically, you run that one command, it automatically will then do the um, update of the cluster virtual machine configuration. Okay. So again, there's a reference to James's uh, uh, slides that uh, you may want to review. Something I think, um, another thing I think Ben is either picking up on today or it may have happened yesterday, I can't remember which way around it is, okay. disaster recovery, how you can actually do replication of your virtual machine. So if you have a situation where out of the box you want to make sure a particular VM or set of VMs are replicated to your DR site, you can do that without any third party software. Okay. So you can set up Hyper-V replica. Okay. Uh, anyone remember, has that happened yesterday or is that happening today? It's today, isn't it? Okay, so later on I think Ben's doing this afternoon. Okay. So most of my focus, I guess, over the last uh, well, 50 odd minutes or whatever has been around um, host clustering, okay, where of course you've got hosts that are then running your workloads, whether that's Hyper-V or SQL or, or whatever it might be. How many of you are running guest clusters within your organization? Anyone got guest clusters that are running as VMs? Anyone doing that? Okay, so that, again, that provides protect protection, I guess, if you've got a workload like SQL or something like that, and you want to run two VMs that are running SQL, okay, and they're you know, effectively you know, running a guest cluster. Um, in the past, if you were doing that, the only way you could do it is if you used iSCSI storage. Now, okay, as you create a VM, you can set up your own virtual um, fiber channel SAN, okay, and you can put in a, a virtual fiber channel adapter into the VM, and then have that accessing the storage through the physical fiber channel HBA. Okay. So if you go to the settings for a virtual machine, okay, you can add new hardware, including setting up a, or adding a, an FC um, virtual adapter. So that's something you may want to investigate. And um, the last thing, or last couple of things really to, to wrap up the session, um, VM monitoring, uh, which gives us the ability to First, uh, as you've already seen uh, at the bottom there, host level HA recovery. In case there's a host failure, we can have VMs powering on. Okay. But now we have extra functionality we can look at where um, the failover cluster will be able to successfully find out whether the VM itself is correctly running. So if we have a VM that blue screens, okay, it can restart the VM because the VM is no longer heart beating to the host. And likewise, it's got application awareness. So without any other products, um, the failover cluster can verify whether the application functionality is there. Okay. So if the application fails, it can again restart that particular VM. Okay. So uh, again, a bit more detail around uh, VM monitoring um, in some of the other sessions if you want to find out about that. And I think these are TechEd North America slide decks you'd need to be looking into. So hopefully over the last hour or so, um, you've been able to see some of the enhancements they've made with regards to failover clustering. Okay. Um, specifically things like um, cluster shared volumes, SMB3 um, for the continuous available file server, okay. um, and the node drain features. Over and above that, some of the Hyper-V features that I've covered off okay, with prioritization and again, um, clustered live migration, okay. um, and a couple of things I've just uh, mentioned towards the end which are gonna be covered in greater detail, as I said, in, in Ben's session. Any specific thoughts, comments, or questions that uh, you'd like to address now? Go. Ah, yeah, okay, so the, the question there, if I can just interpret there, um, what, what do I make of VHDX, which is effectively what you're asking there, I've got. Oh, yep. Oh, yep. That's a good question. Again, so just to repeat that, um, what the question is saying is why when you create your CSV, um, was it a VHD instead of a VHDX? Okay. Um, now, I wasn't actually creating a CSV as such there. I was creating an iSCSI target. Okay. So the iSCSI target still continues by the looks of it to use VHD format instead of VHDX format. Okay. I hadn't actually even thought about that. For those of you who are unaware, um, you may, may be um, worthwhile pointing out the fact that you can actually have VHDX, which actually goes beyond the two terabyte limitation that you can have for your, your disks. Yeah. Um, but that's more of an iSCSI thing, I think, than it is uh, um, to do with CSVs. Yeah. Okay, so 
Um, related content, I've mentioned uh, and given a bit of a plug for um, Ben Armstrong sessions that he's going to be doing uh, a little bit later on, so feel free to attend those. If you want to have a chat with me, um, I've been hanging out in the exam room. Um, we've still got time if anyone wants, wants to do any prometric exams um, today, if you're really keen on some exams. Probably the worst thing to be thinking after Tech Fest, I guess. You're probably a head full of other things. Okay. And the important thing with regards to the competition, okay, this is the way it's going to work. You need to send a tweet with the answer to James's question and my question. Okay. Um, and the details are around that. So you need to ha include those hashtags there, so TENZ -T and the two session ones. Okay. James's question yesterday, whether you need to actually import any modules to be able to get access to the Hyper-V or the failover cluster um, commandlets. And my second, or my, the second part of that question, my question, the maximum number of nodes in a Windows Server 2012 failover cluster. So yes, take your pictures now. Um, we will choose or randomly select one of the tweets which meets that criteria. And as Nathan is handing over, okay, um, it'll be for these um, Samsung notebooks. So what we'll do is we'll contact you okay, if you are the winner. Um, we'll either get you to come to the old house stand or get you guys to come to the Microsoft stand um, and get hold of the, um, the PC that, or the laptop rather that you've won. So again, hopefully you've found the last hour to be useful and you've picked up a few things.